Welcome back to another installment of Ologies. In this week's video, we will be discussing Lepidopterology, the scientific study of butterflies and moths. We'll find out what a Lepidopterologist does, learn about the differences between butterflies and moths, a little bit about how they grow and behave, and of course, touch on some of our favorite local species. It's a big word for a big topic, so sit tight and enjoy the video. So what is Lepidopterology? Lepidopterology is an odd word to say, and even harder to spell, and originates from the Greek word lepidos, meaning scale, and tero, meaning wing, or to fly. This week's ology is the scientific study of moths and the three superfamilies of butterflies. The wings of moths and butterflies are covered in extremely small scales, which is how the term lepidopterology is derived. As with many modern fields of scientific study, Lepidopterology began to resemble what we know it as today during the early to mid-1800s, but its roots extend all the way back to post-Renaissance society. The first body of works published on Lepidopteran natural history seemed to have emerged in the mid-1600s. Modern Lepidopterology is a branch of entomology, which is the scientific study of insects. Given that there are approximately 1.3 million known species of insects, and that they make up approximately two-thirds of all known species on Earth, today we'll just focus on some of our favorite local pollinators, butterflies and moths. So what makes a butterfly a butterfly and a moth a moth? Although they might look similar, the list of shared characteristics is probably shorter than you might think. For starters, there are about 17,500 known species of butterflies in the world, and over 160,000 species of moth. With that many species fluttering about, there are bound to be a few exceptions, but let's start off with some general characteristics for each. At a glance, we can usually know a butterfly from a moth by how they hold their wings. Butterflies tend to fold their wings upright when resting, while moths will usually lay their wings down flat against their body, or fold them back in a jet plane position. Butterflies tend to have long, smooth antennas and sleek bodies, whereas moths tend to be a bit fuzzy, with feather-like antennas. Behaviorally, butterflies tend to be diurnal, and moths tend to be nocturnal. Moths are still more likely to be seen during the day than a butterfly is at night. But have you ever wondered why moths seem so drawn to porch lights? It's because most have adapted to navigate by the light of the moon, so those nighttime light sources can be pretty confusing for them. Then again, remember those exceptions I mentioned? Some moth species, like the Madagascan sunset moth, are definitely on that list. It's not native to Ohio, but it is pretty interesting. Not only is it active during the day, and occasionally seen holding its wings upright like a butterfly, it is also much more brightly colored than your typical moth too. There are also some big differences in moth and butterfly life cycles, but that's a whole topic of its own. Both moth and butterfly life cycles begin with the female insect laying a clutch of eggs, and the number of eggs varies depending on the species. Some lay as few as 40 or 50, and others lay hundreds. The mothers are very particular about which plants they lay their eggs on, and how they determine this might surprise you. Most species of caterpillars only eat certain types of plants, so it's important that the mother leaves her eggs somewhere where her larva will be able to find a lot of food. She will first flit from plant to plant, seeking out one that is the right size and shape. Then she'll give them a taste. Not with her proboscis, the long straw-like tongue a butterfly uses to drink, and moths don't have any mouth parts at all. They taste these plants with their feet. Female butterflies and moths have small spines on the underside of their forelimbs, which will puncture a leaf and release certain chemicals and aromas. The mother's olfactory glands, located on her feet, will then taste and smell this chemical response to make sure she's in the right place. Once eggs have been laid, it will usually only take a few days for the larva to emerge. We know these as caterpillars. A caterpillar will spend all of its time eating, growing, and storing up energy. Both moths and butterflies must go through the process of metamorphosis to reach maturity, and that can be a big task for a tiny larva. Once a caterpillar is fully grown, it is ready to enter the next stage of its life, the pupil stage. This is where the magic happens, or as scientists call it, metamorphosis. During this time, moths will create a cocoon spun and wrapped in silk. Butterflies will complete their metamorphosis inside a chrysalis, which is a smooth, hardened shell that naturally encases the fully grown larva through the duration of this process. Unlike moths, a butterfly's chrysalis grows within the body like a new layer of skin. When it molts, or sheds its skin, for the final time a chrysalis will be waiting beneath it. Time spent in the pupal stage varies from species to species, 
but in the case of the monarch butterfly, pictured here, it will take about two weeks for metamorphosis to complete. The chrysalis will become transparent, showing the new butterfly's bright orange wings below. Once the butterfly or moth emerges, they will spend a short time stretching and drying out their wings before being able to fly. Their transformation is complete. Some moths and butterflies will live in their adult stage for only a few weeks and must reproduce rapidly. In the case of the monarch, those that emerge in the spring and early summer will live about three weeks, but those that emerge late in the summer and into October will migrate down to the mountains of Mexico to overwinter. By February, milkweed will be growing again in Texas and the southern parts of the United States, and their life cycle can continue. It is their offspring that we see travel back north to us in the spring. Now let's move on to some of Ohio's most easily recognizable species of moths and butterflies. Some of these are relatively common, while others you may have never seen before. Ohio's abundance of native wildflowers attract all sorts of butterflies, though one of the most popular is, of course, the monarch. But did you know that the monarch's range here actually overlaps with a look-alike? The viceroy butterfly, pictured here on the right, looks pretty similar, but note the additional lines on its hind wings. This mimicry helps the viceroy evade predators. There are a lot of creatures who think a butterfly makes a good snack, from wasps and toads to birds and snakes. However, many potential predators will leave the monarch alone because they taste terrible and can even be toxic to some creatures because of the milkweed they eat as caterpillars. If a viceroy can be mistaken for a monarch, it has a higher chance of surviving and passing on its genes. Swallowtail butterflies are also common in Ohio, and can be easy to spot due to their large sizes and vivid colors. Three of my favorites include the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, the Spicebush Swallowtail, and the Zebra Swallowtail. The Tiger Swallowtail is the largest of the three, and prefers open meadows. Unlike many of our local butterfly species, the Spicebush and Zebra Swallowtail are just as likely to be seen in wooded edge habitat, where there is space for them to fly. Also, remember what we were saying about mimicry? Not only does the adult spicebush swallowtail mimic a toxic look-alike, its caterpillars do their best to trick predators into thinking it might actually be a snake. While not quite as impressive visually as our previous examples, if you've spent any time in our meadows, you've probably seen your fair share of cabbage whites and clouded sulfur butterflies. These are abundant throughout the entire summer season and can live very comfortably in urban areas as well as rural spaces. They like to frequent our neighborhood parks. Moving on to moths, you might be surprised to learn we have a few very interesting moth species as well. Many moth species are rather small and colored in various shades of gray, white, and brown to help them camouflage into their environments. It can be difficult to tell one species from another without a good hard look. However, there are a few amazing specimens that are much easier to tell apart. One of these is the Cecropia moth, often found in mature hardwood forests. Not only are they vividly patterned in red as well as brown, these moths can grow up to seven inches from wingtip to wingtip. Another amazing Ohio moth species is the Luna moth, also called the moon moth. Apparently brown isn't a good color on them. They prefer vivid green instead. Though smaller than a Cecropia moth, this species can still grow up to four inches in wingspan and are also found in deciduous hardwood forests. They are most active on nights when the moon is very bright and are very attracted to light sources. So keep an eye out by porch lights and campfires you never know what you might find. If you'd like to see more butterflies and moths in your neighborhood, there are a few things you can do to make sure your habitat is suitable for them. If you do find eggs or caterpillars, be sure not to disturb them. Each species plays an important part in a larger food chain too, so by supporting these insects, you also help support birds, bats, our local reptiles and amphibians too. Only about 2% of moth and butterfly caterpillars will grow to adulthood which is, of course, why they lay so many eggs. During the summer, adult butterflies still require water, minerals, and nectar from blooming flowers, but adult moths don't eat at all. The best way you can make sure you are supporting both is to provide host plants for their caterpillars to munch on as they grow. Remember, every species has its favorite foods, so be sure to research what your favorite species likes to eat the most. If you plant that, you never know what might show up next spring. Thank you for joining us in this latest episode of Ologies. We hope you learned something new about Ohio's awesome butterflies and moths. Next step, get out into your big backyard and see if you can't spot some specimens of your own. Check out your activity PDF for some awesome activities to help you keep your studies going. As always, we love to hear about your educational exploits and to help out if we can, so feel free to reach out. Thank you again for joining us, and as always, we hope you have a wonderful week.